Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, all the uh, organizers in Ravenna for the delivery of this uh, doctoral summer school. It's a great, great pleasure to be able to introduce the first session um, on preventive conservation. And um, I've uh, I've given various um, various versions of this preservation of this presentation, um, but today I'd like to focus specifically on decisions and how we model decisions in preventive conservation, specifically from the viewpoint of stakeholders such as the general public. Jana before me already mentioned words such as lifetimes and the public, and I feel, and uh, alongside myself, I, I, I think there's quite a number of conservation professionals who feel that the general public has a lot to say about how we preserve cultural heritage for how long and what they see as damage in preventive conservation or in conservation more generally. And perhaps we need to take those views into account as we model the degradation of materials as we model the lifetimes of objects and as we model the scenarios of environmental management in collections. And this is what I'd like to focus on a little bit in today's lecture. My, I have two affiliations. I'm Professor of Heritage Science at University College London in UK, when most of this work has been uh, done. And I'm Professor of Analytical Chemistry at University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And I manage the Heritage Science Academy of the Iberian HS project and of the uh, of IRIS, uh, uh, the, the infrastructure, um, which Jana mentioned in her presentation presentation. Um, the energy crisis um, of 2000 um, of, of the of the late notice has really prompted the conservation community to think hard about how decisions are made in long term preservation of collections. We knew then pretty well how environmental considerations such as temperature, relative humidity, pollutants and, and light affected, uh, affect collection uh, materials. Uh, we could, we knew that equations such as the Arrhenius equation, which chemists among you will know really well, affect the degradation of organic materials, for example. We know that relative humidity has uh, specific effects on biodegradation if it exceeds about uh, 70, 75 percent, but below that it may have a, um, a, a promoting effect on hydrolysis reactions, but also on ox oxidation reactions. We know that pollutants have many, many different effects on heritage materials from oxidation to hydrolysis. They may lead to uh, discoloration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, we know that light doses may have different effects on the photooxidation of a variety of materials, predominantly of organic origin. So there is a lot of chemical as well as physical knowledge or mechanical knowledge about material degradation that has been expressed in many ways using many chemicals and mechanical models of material behavior. But how to contextualize that knowledge, how to contextualize the science that we do remained a question. And within the British Standardization Institute uh, PAS project, which ran for a couple of years and resulted in the publication of, a, of an environmental management guideline in 2012. And a lot of that content later on, um, uh, later on was taken up by European standardization organizations. In that project, um, we 
started to think about collection considerations that build on environmental considerations and that need to take into account not just the material sensitivity of our collections and which material scientists among us or chemists among us know uh, pretty, pretty a lot about, but we also have to take into account the, the way that collections are used. And some collections, um, let, I mean, we, we need to be quite frank about that. Some collections are obviously used physically. For example, in libraries and archives, materials are used and, and uh, physically in, in the way that they are handled manually, uh, because books obviously need to be read in order to be of use. However, um, long-term preservation has an effect on energy consumption. Uh, obviously, we need energy in order, in order to cool down collections in the summer, if we want to keep them at moderate temperatures, and we need to heat buildings in the winter in order to prevent freezing or in order to enable users to read books or archival materials in reading rooms. So the energy footprint of preventive conservation may in some cases be so high that it exceeds more than half of the budget of an archive or a library. So it makes a lot of sense to understand how the energy footprint can be modeled, how it can be understood better or um, optimized, and of course, what climate change might mean, say, in 2050 or 2080, in terms of the energy required to keep our collections safe, conserved and preserved. However, the difficult questions come from from the expect from from uh, lifetime expectancy, meaning that we also need to have a frank discussion about how long into the future we want to keep documents in a state that is readable, that can be consulted, and that is meaningful to readers or um, anyone accessing objects in libraries and archives. And the reason why I'm focusing on archives and libraries specifically is because so much is known about historic paper degradation and so much is known about how paper, um, re uh, how paper responds to temperature, relative humidity, pollution and light. So I'll be using the case of libraries and archives as a case study, perhaps for general preventive conservation management or decision modeling in preventive conservation. However, people access heritage collections for very different reasons and to understand how long they want collections to be preserved for, we need to understand why they value those collections in the first place. This has very little to do with um, natural sciences and it has a lot to do with social sciences because methods have been developed in social science to understand how people attitudes change depending on the motives for access to cultural heritage in our instance. And some people may study library and archival collections because they study their family history. Others may be studying um, archival collections because they study law or for legal reasons and others obviously go to libraries because they are doctoral students such as perhaps yourselves. So we have very, very different motives to access heritage collections and because of that, our values reflect those motives in very different, uh, in very different ways. Why is this important? It's really important in terms of the inner circle that I talked about uh, in my previous slide, where we discussed 
the intended use of collections and expected lifetimes. And as we will see, those two aspects where two key decisions need to be made about collection lifetimes, for example, are very much affected by how we value collections. In order to understand these issues, in order to understand how visitors, how the general public value our heritage collections, we had to consult the general public, i.e. the readers, in many different institutions through an attitude questionnaire. In total, we distributed 543 questionnaires. These consisted of 60 different questions, so they took a bit of time to respond to, so we offered free coffee to anyone who uh, responded, and we got a really, really good response. Uh, we had 290 respondents at the National Archives in Kew in London, 103 at the Library of Congress in Washington, uh, almost 100 at English heritage uh, uh, country, uh, country houses in, in libraries there, but also approximately 50 or slightly more respondents in situations where library and archival materials are only displayed and not handled, so museum visitors. This was a number of respondents that was high enough for us to be able to do factor analysis on the statements that were contained in those uh, questionnaires. Those statements were based on various interviews that we did with curators, uh, conservators, but also readers and uh, the general public. And that reflected their, the, uh, the, the various statements that we heard from them as they talked about objects that are valuable to them. And as I mentioned earlier, people value materials, people value heritage for very different reasons. For example, um, uh, some are some value library resources because they have something to write their dissertations about. Others go to archives because they, uh, uh, they want to find their family or research or family history, um, et cetera, et cetera. So from these statements that we got in uh, the interviews, through the interviews, we developed the uh, attitude questionnaire. And through factor analysis, which is a very similar technique to principal component analysis, which uh, some of you might know um, who have taken advanced statistics courses. Um, through factor analysis, we were able to group the statements that were um, that that people uh, that our respondents agreed with in different patterns. And it turned out that uh, we were able to group those statements in nine different factors, which we then interpreted using a focus group. Now, the focus group discussions were very, very interesting because we had to understand what the meaning of statements that grouped together was. And we interpreted, for example, the first factor, the, the statements that grouped according to factor one, as value that corresponded to existence and future value of objects. Namely, heritage objects may be valuable just because they exist. We may never access them, we may never actually use those books, but we value library and archival collections because they are. I may never visit some of the incredible heritage sites across the world, but I value the Easter Island statues, for example, because I know they are there, they are meaningful and they are beautiful, although I may never actually visit them. It was very, very interesting that out of the nine factors, only one corresponded to actual material um, characteristics of objects. 
This factor we called materials and sensory experience and reflected the attitude of respondents to the style and design of documents, to the material of which the documents were made, for example, in our case, obviously, papers, inks, parchment, etc., etc. Um, they also reflected the, um, decor the attitudes to, obviously, decoration of the documents, for example, book bindings and, and similar, uh, the appearance, colors, but not just visual information, also olfactory information. We know that a lot of people appreciate historic libraries because of the way that old books smell. And I, I could talk about book smell for very long. Uh, some of you may, may know that some of my research focuses on, on historic smells. And of course, some appreciated the actual age of those materials which uh, can also be considered uh, to be a material uh, property. The rest of the factors reflected, for example, public value, the value of objects to public businesses, to public activities, uh, for example, uh, books representing an economic resource, uh, and some of um, the factor four um, represented values associated with personal meaning and identity and so on. What's really telling is that there's only one factor that reflects the materiality of objects. All the rest were related to the content of documents which can be extracted by reading those documents or even by consulting digital copies of those documents. But only one factor was specifically focused on the, on the, 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 physic, the physical properties or chemical properties of the documents themselves, which really provides an interesting lens on the importance of um, natural scientific research in conservation. We, one of the most important questions uh, that we asked in the questionnaire was about how long our respondents wanted or uh, wished for the documents or books um, to be kept in a readable state or in a good enough state to be displayed. And what was super, super interesting is that about while about 20% of respondents were perfectly happy with a 50 year um, with a 50 year uh, planning horizon, approximately 50% were happy with a 100 years uh, horizon. This is this is a very, very interesting number because it represents approximately three generations meaning that the majority of uh, our respondents um, would be happy to keep those documents in a readable state until the generation of their grandchildren can still, uh, um, so that the generation of their grandchildren can still access those collections. This is, this is a very meaningful response because uh, we can typically see about three generations in advance. Everything that is beyond the generation of our grandchildren um, is, generally, is generally considered uh, far future and we have difficulties, um, um, uh, uh, we have difficulties identifying ourselves with so far uh, into the future. However, Approximately 90% of respondents would want op objects to be kept for 500 years and about 10% of the respondents wanted those objects to be kept more than a thousand years. There is a very, very small group of respondents who wanted uh, books to be kept forever. And of course, chemists among us will know that that is just not possible uh, due to fairly basic thermodynamic laws. However, what this plot tells us is that there is a planning horizon that would satisfy approximately 90% of the general public, and that's about 500 years, 
And there is a planning horizon for long-term preservation that would uh, satisfy about 50% of the general public, and that's about 100 years. Now, these are decisions that need to be taken by uh, curators, that need to be taken by collection managers and uh, heritage institutions themselves on the basis of evidence provided. And the evidence is that in terms of preservation planning, we don't need to plan for thousands of years in advance. We only need to plan for about 100 or 500 years, and even that is very, very long indeed in comparison, in comparison to natural resource conservation. In nature conservation, typical long-term planning horizons are between 50 and 100 years, so shorter than what came out of our study. And we may still need to rethink these planning horizons. Now, what planning horizons mean is that we're not planning for books to entirely disintegrate in 500 years, not at all. We're just planning our resources such that for the next 500 years, books remain in a readable state. However, what does that mean? That required a, a, um, an entirely new piece of research. Um, we, in a, uh, in a um, following piece of research, we explored what types of documents are fit for purpose, again, from the viewpoint of a general reader, and um, that were degraded to different extents, both chemically and mecha mechanically. We looked at library and archival collections, and we saw that the majority of what could be considered as damage consisted of missing pages, missing pieces of papers, of, uh, of text, uh, torn paper, so predominantly mechanical damage. But we know from chemistry that uh, mechanical damage on um, on historical paper is mainly the consequence of low degree of polymerization of cellulose in paper documents. Cellulose, as many of you will know, consists of, um, of uh, identical monomers called glucose uh, monosaccharide units, and the number of those monosaccharide units uh, is called the degree of polymerization. As cellulose degrades due to either hydrolysis or oxidation, the degree of polymerization will change. It will um, necessarily become shorter and shorter. And as it becomes critically short, um, paper becomes brittle. And it's that chemical process that leads to a high level of risk that during leafing through a book, a piece of text may get, torn, may get torn away and therefore lost forever. Um, another potential source of dissatisfaction among readers could be discoloration of paper, uh, because the, the darker the paper, the more difficult may uh, the text may become to read. Therefore, we included uh, discoloration as a potential source of uh, discontent as well. So we presented um, 17 differently distressed types um, uh, of papers, uh, differently distressed pages from a manuscript. Um, that that was obviously sacrificial and had no historical value. And we presented those to our visitors, to our readers in archives, galleries and libraries. And we asked the public to tell us which papers they consider as unfit for the purpose of reading or for the purpose of display in a historical library and which papers they consider to be still fit, but not good anymore. So we considered the damage threshold to be between four and five, meaning that 
those papers that were graded as four were still good enough for access, but those that were graded as five were considered unfit for use. And that, for us, constituted the damage threshold. So any documents that were degraded beyond four were considered as unfit for purpose. Now, as I discussed uh, a couple of minutes ago, the degradation of historic paper is mainly the consequence of chemical degradation, of, of uh, chain scission, and of degradation of cellulose, because cellulose is the most important structural component of historic paper. And because so much has been done on uh, degradation of historic paper in various laboratories throughout, uh, the, uh, throughout the past four or five decades, we did a meta study of literature. We pulled experiments from different, uh, from, um, conducted by different researchers and, um, and in different conditions. And we were able to model the rates of degradation as measured by various different researchers in the past using a single equation. Now, the equation looks a little bit um, complex, but in but it actually isn't. Why? Because it consists of two main terms. The first main term is a term that corresponds or that describes the response of paper to relative humidity. Uh, this is the isotherm term, if you like. And the second term is the Arrhenius term. And this term consists obviously of, uh, the, of temperature, because we know that temperature affects the rate of chemical degradations. And as a pre-exponential factor, uh, we also see the effect of pH or acidity, concentration of acidity in paper. So the rate of degradation expressed as logarithm of the rate of chain scission then, con then depends on three main parameters. Relative humidity of the storage environment, Temperature of the storage environment, we see that temperature is contained in three in three different uh, places in our equation and of the pH of paper of um, i.e. the acidity of paper. We were uh, pretty surprised that this equation, uh, that using this equation, it was possible to predict the rate of degradation of historic paper fairly well. We see that our modeled rates of degradation uh, correspond to the actual measured or observed, experimentally observed rates of degradation across a range of temperatures and relative humidities as well as acidities of paper. So using this equation, it should now be possible to model the rate of chemical degradation of paper, the rate of chain scission that ultimately, ultimately leads to brittle paper, depending on temperature, acidity, and relative humidity. Now, that's very important because we can measure the degree of polymerization and the acidity of paper using fairly similar techniques, uh, such as, for example, IR spectroscopy or even simple handheld NIR instruments uh, such as the one here in, in the picture, where one of our PhD students, well, now uh, a doctor, a PhD already, um, is, uh, we see that she's measuring the NIR spectra of Islamic paper at the Wellcome Collection in London. Of course, near-infrared spectra are not particularly exciting. They contain just a small number of peaks. Um, but what is important in NIR spectroscopy is that those peaks can be modeled using multivariate calibration and that chemical properties of materials such as degree of polymerization or acidity can be modeled on the basis of spectra that can be obtained fairly using fairly simple handheld portable instruments. 
Some of those instruments are available in the Iperion HS catalog. However, in order to conduct these analyses, it's not just the instruments that are needed. We also need calibration equations. And in order to develop those, we need to, to do a little bit of data juggling and fairly advanced um, um, multivariate calibration uh, using calibration samples. However, suffice it to say that using this technique, it is now possible to measure the inputs that are essential to model the rate of degradation of any given piece of paper. Now, in order to develop our model, our general model of, a, of how a collection might degrade in the future, we have all the variables, all the model components, if you like. On the one hand, we have the dose response function. Um, we know that the rate of degradation depends on temperature, pH, and relative humidity. Of course, temperature and relative humidity can be measured um, um, and, and is, are measured um, on, a, on an hourly basis in, in numerous heritage organizations, and that data is readily, often readily available. The um, starting degree of polymerization and the acidity of paper needs to be measured at least for a selected number of uh, objects in a collection. We also know that at approximately 300 degree of polymerization, paper becomes so brittle that the risk of pages breaking at a single instance of reading, at a single instance of turning a document, is already so high that um, it wouldn't be advisable for such paper to be accessible to a general reader, to a reader in a reading room. And finally, we can operate with planning horizons uh, fairly confidently now because we know that approximately 50% of the public would want to keep documents in a readable state. So until they start to break uh, for about uh, 100 years and approximately 90% for about 500 years. So we know we now have all the decision variables. We have the threshold fitness for purpose, which is degree of polymerization 300. We have the planning horizon, which could be 100 years, 500 years, more, uh, whatever the institution uh, may want to decide to use. And we have the equation using which we can model how documents degrade in the future. And at this point, I will need to change my screen and stop sharing because what I want to share is a website or rather a shiny app where we integrated the damage function or the dose response function into an online accessible app where conservators or researchers or collection managers can explore various um, decisions and various types of collections and collection uh, timelines and see how temperature, relative humidity, or even conservation actions, such as paper deacidification, might affect the lifetimes of their collections. Not just collections, but also of uh, single papers. Um, you will see that the app uh, consists of two tabs. It, uh, it has a tab that enables us to model single objects, but also collections. I'll focus on collections uh, in a minute. Let's look at the single objects app first. Um, there are several presets, preset types of papers. Let's say that we're modeling the lifetime of a typical acidic paper. Um, and the average acidic paper in our study collection has pH of 5.2. 
a starting degree of polymerization of 826, and we can decide on any critical degree of polymerization that corresponds to what we consider uh, to be the end of lifetime or the threshold uh, fitness uh, for purpose. Let's say that the average temperature in our storage environment is 20 degrees and the relative humidity is 50%, so what might be considered as standard conditions. Of course, we can play around in uh, degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit if we like. And we see that the um, lifetime predicted for this type of paper is 350 years. Now, we may want to change that lifetime and um, see what might happen if we decrease the temperature, say, by, uh, a couple, by, by four degrees. And we see that by cooling the collection from 20 average degrees uh, throughout the year to 16 degrees throughout the year, we comfortably exceed the planning horizon of even 500 years. We could decrease the relative humidity if we want, so we de dehumidify the, uh, the environment uh, constantly and continuously, and we uh, achieve an even better uh, lifetime. Of course, we can also change the, um, the acidity of paper. Conservators among you will know that paper deacidification is a very common technique where acids in paper are uh, neutralized and a little bit of excess carbonate is added into paper, achieving an average pH of approximately eight. And if we deacidify paper, we suddenly obtain a very, very good uh, uh, and a very well extended lifetime of 1750 years. Now we can explore various environmental scenarios as well. Let's say that we use a planning horizon of 500 years, and what we see is that there is a good range of temperatures and relative humidities within which our piece of paper were, will comfortably achieve um, the, the planned horizon of 100 years. Of course, if we change the planned horizon to 100 years, this uh, plot will change meaning that um, there, is a, um, there is a different range of temperatures and relative humidities within which this uh, planned horizon will be, uh, will be reached. Let's have a look at the uh, collection model. So this is a model that allows us to model the, um, this is a set of equations that allows us to model entire collections. Um, in this case, uh, let's say, uh, let's again enter 20 uh, degrees centigrade, 50% relative humidity, the rest let's keep uh, as it is. And let's say that we have a typical mixed collection of paper, uh, some of it at time zero is acidic, some of it is contemporary, meaning that its starting pH is 8. Uh, some of it is pretty historic, meaning that it is uh, that it has been made by um, from rack from old racks. Such papers are typically a little bit more uh, a little bit more stable, and we can model the lifetime of such a collection fairly easily. And by modeling the lifetime, I actually mean um, how quickly individual objects in this collection will degrade into the future. We see that the fitness for use is postulated to be 100% at time zero, which is now, and that in approximately 50 years, at the conditions of storage, we will retain about 60% of our collection that is still fit for use, meaning that it can still be safely uh, manipulated in a library or in a library reading room. The rest of the books may still be useful for reading, but perhaps only under supervision. So the resources for access um, will need to be higher or else such books will have to be digitized before the, their fitness for use is reduced critically. Of course, we can change the environmental conditions fairly easily. 
uh, using our app. So let's say that we uh, want to keep our collection at 16 uh, degrees C. Let's see what happens with the plot then. Uh, if we reduce the temperature in our storage room, we see that we will then keep approximately 84% of our collection for the next 500 years. So the app enables collection managers to model the effects of their decisions. Do they want to deacidify books or do they want to keep them cool and invest a lot into energy? in the next, throughout the next 500 years, that is one of the big questions that can be answered using this app. Now, various decision makers can model their own collections. They can model the composition of their collections. So let's say that we enter the composition of a typical Western library that consists of approximately 70% of acidic papers approximately 25% uh, of contemporary papers, 0% or a few percent of deacidified papers and approximately 5% of rack paper. That's a, that's, ob that's a typical historical uh, library in, uh, in Europe or in, in, in North America. And we see that for a library of this composition, under the conditions of storage as specified above, we will keep approximately 70% of the library collection in a usable state for the next 500 years. Now I'll turn back to my presentation and explore a little bit what might happen if we actually decide to use Yeah, we can. This is just there, to let you know that there are four minutes left. OK, thank you very thank much. You. I'm well in time. Thank you, Rocco. So let's see what might happen if we still decide to use mechanical air conditioning in a 1970s building, such as the storage building at Kew in uh, southwestern London. Um, this is a large storage building that was purpose built, is mechanically controlled by four HVAC plants, and those plants uh, keep the air within the rep repository to some pre specified, uh, at some pre specified value. For a very long period of time, library standards required that the temperature in repositories should be capped at 18 degrees centigrade and that the relative humidity should be kept at 50 percent um, plus minus a very narrow interval of temperature and relative humidity. However, that is incredibly energy demanding and we calculated that with those uh, demands the baseline energy load, the baseline energy use in kilowatt hours per square meter per year was uh, 33. If we, using the, the building model that was developed in Energy Plus, which is, uh, which is a fairly complex uh, building modeling uh, tool, if we modeled the, um, the energy load when during weekends the climate was not controlled, we could um, we could uh, we could save about 20% of uh, energy. However, if we model the temperature and relative humidity that is seasonally adjusted, meaning that the temperature in the summer is approximately two to three percent hotter. And then average, and that the energy that the temperature in the winter is approximately two to three degrees uh, uh, cooler than average. We could save approximately forty percent of energy compared to the baseline, which means constant temperature and relative humidity throughout the year. In addition, using our damage function, we were able to model that the preservation outcome of such a decision would actually be better because on average, the collection would survive for longer. 
even if it is kept slightly hotter in the summer, the cooling effect in the winter uh, offsets that loss. And it turns out that if we downscale the external climate and if we use the downscaled temperature and relative humidity data for Q in southeast London, we would save enough energy to offset the, the requirements to work against the external climate by 15 percent, uh, I mean uh, by about um, 30 percent, and by about a half even in 2080. So using a fairly simple um, seasonally adjusted environmental management system in a repository, in uh, Q at the National Archives, it is not only possible to save 43% 40 of the energy bill today, but it will be possible to offset even external, uh, even climate change, uh, even uh, climate change uh, requirements in 2080 fairly comfortably. Concludes my presentation. I hope I'm in time, Rocco, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you very much for attending. Great, Mattia, you are perfectly in time, as always.